Bravely walk in immortal battle to stand out the truth and the good. But who will have doubts to admit a neither less exceptional act of bravery committed by a Pacific soldier of science? The one who can see the only purpose of his whole life ahead of him, its verity. The one who honestly, with neither tiredness nor weary, is walking toward his supreme destination. These words have been said about the person whose significance for the Russian jurisprudence can be only compared to the influence on the Russian literature by Alexander Pushkin. The contemporary Russian language is hard to imagine without Pushkin's creative heritage, same as contemporary civil law would have never been possible with no grounds contributed by Dmitry Meyer. Encyclopedia references formally point out the dates of his short life, 1819-1856, just followed by the same brief definition, a most famous civil lawyer. These two words represent a titanic amount of work by one person who managed to do them real. It was Dmitry Mayer who developed and began to read to his students an absolutely innovative course of the Russian civil law. The Russian legal science still uses the subject and object so the civil legal relationship Mayer defined. He wasn't limited by the frames of his knowing the civil law and civil court trial. He managed to combine civil law with such a discipline as pedagogics. He managed to become a friend to his students, not just a man who used to stand behind the lecturing desk and just read his lectures. There may be other wonderful people who do that, but Mayer, who was able to materialize that very synergy of standard civil law and his attitude to the students, he could become their friend, their closest mentor. And that mentoring it keeps on coming through centuries. It's no coincidence that quite a few libraries dedicated to the legal heritage they undoubtedly start with Mayer. By the middle 19th century, the science of civil law as we know it merely hadn't existed yet. Lectures that had been read to students used to be a boring enumeration of the Roman law postulates. Future lawyers used to be taught classical and newest philosophy and the history of jurisprudence. The Russian law used to start with some detailed analysis of the Russian truth, the judge book by Ivan III and the constitution by Tsar Alexei Mikhailovich, whereas the final part of the course included the statements of the State Advisory Board and the Governmental Senate. But how could one, though quite an extraordinary person, come to be the founder of the whole direction of Russian jurisprudence, which all the contemporary legal research is based on? Perhaps the explanations have to be looked for in the personality of Dmitry Mayer and his life path. At the first sight, his life wasn't filled with loud victories, powerful shakes or any breathtaking triumph. Educated in St. Petersburg and abroad, he taught for more than 10 years at Kazan University. Then he moved back to his mother town St. Petersburg to spend his few final months out there. But for that short period of time, he not only made a legend of Russian jurisprudence, but also had a great influence on both acts and characters of quite a few famous individuals in the common atmosphere of the Russian community of the middle 19th century. We've got to recall the times uh, Mayer lived in. Uh, it's probably the second part closer to the end of Nicholas I's reign. That very military barrack spirit in Russia. And during that time a person, a young man, appears, uh, I would say, a persevering free thinker, the one who broaches the question of civil rights for the bond man, the one who declares that teaching the law by means of enumerating the postulates of the Roman law, cramming other sources of legal science, uh, well, it's all destructive for Russian reality for the whole sense of Russian jurisprudence. The person who begins to point out the grounds of the Russian civil law. Dmitry Meyer was born in St. Petersburg in 1819 into the family of a russified German, a courtier musician. A capable young man named Dietrich Hornberth in 1841 graduated from the main pedagogical college, the Faculty of Legal Science. When a student, the talented youngster caught the eye of Count Tovarov. The Minister of Education, Sergei Varov, broke through into the history with his famous triad of orthodoxy, autocracy, nation, which was declared the Russian monarchy doctrine and the minister got a status of a dedicated servant of the Nicholas age. 
Kovarov wasn't a revolutionary indeed, but his actions drew Russia into radical changes. Due to him, a system of professional education first appeared in Russia. Besides, the Count actively supported what nowadays would have been called the system of extranational learning exchange. He willingly used to send students and scientists abroad to gain experience. To us Count Kovarov, who in early 1842 directed Dmitry Mayer to Berlin University. In the university rooms, the Russian student might have met the young Friedrich Engels, who in spring 1842 began to listen to the course of philosophy there. And just one year separated Mayer from meeting the future co-author of Engels. Karl Marx had finished studying at the legal faculty in 1841. Mayer was fortunate to listen to the lectures by the founding father of the historic school of law, Gustav Hugo. The student from Russia was warmly accepted by famous Friedrich Karl von Savigny, who had been just assigned to occupy the position of the Minister on Legal Reforms, nevertheless he kept on teaching. Savigny used to persuade his students that the main task of the current law was its accordance with national self-consciousness. For the young lawyer from Russian Empire, those ideas and methods turned out to be a discovery and abasement which not only his all further work would be constructed on, but his whole life too. However, in his life with its trivial destiny, the same sad common fate would be repeated over and over. The short creative triumph used to cost him an immense price to pay. In 1844, Mayer came back to St. Petersburg. The pedagogical college had just declared a vacancy for a tutor of Russian law. In order to get the position in his alma mater, he had to read a trial lecture. The foster child of the Romantic Europe selects a relevant subject. The seeker's lecture was titled About Civil Relationship of Bandmei. Its success was incredible. The young lecturer, looking like an age mate for the listening students, impressed everyone with his volume of knowledge, clear statements and skillful way of presenting the materials. But his pedagogical talent and extraordinary way of thinking turned out to be fatal for a mayor's teaching career. The candidate seemed too brave for St. Petersburg. The young lawyer is hypocritically sent out to Kazan. On the 15th of February, 1844, mayor is assigned to be an adjunct administrator at Kazan University, which had been founded in 1804 and came to be the second university ever opened in the area of Russia so far. Its legal faculty had appeared at an order made by Tsar Nicholas I in 1835. For nine years a traditional style of teaching had been formed. Mayor's coming could be compared to a bomb explosion that changed both the whole system of teaching and destiny of its graduates forever as well. Mayor came to Kazan in April. The new tutor and his students first met at a transition exam. Most students failed to pass that exam. Mayor wasn't limited by smashing the stream. He demanded from the rectorate to get even those who had passed the examination obliged to listen to the course of civil law. The college principal, a famous mathematician Anatoly Lobachevsky, had to be given a tribute for listening to the persistent newcomer's demands. Mayer used to be a unique teacher. He never kept records of his lectures. He improvised during the classes, getting the audience absorb his enthusiasm. The students were getting such quality skills that used to be genuine discoveries in that period of time. Moreover, those lectures used to be the proof of immense civil bravery Mayer possessed. He convincingly proved how harmful bondman slavery, bribing and pension rights by noble relative ties actually were for normal maintenance of civil jurisprudence. Lawyer is like a doctor. First of all he applies diagnostics and then starts curing itself. And when he finds infection now and then, it sometimes deserves a kind of surgery procedures for the problem to be cut off with a kind of some legal scalpel. And that's precisely what Mayer used to do. The lectures would often cause most unexpected feedback. One of the listeners, impressed by his tutor's speeches, rejected a profitable bargain of buying bondmen. Student. 
One of the students listening to Mayer's course in Kazan University left a description of his tutor that read, extremely nervous and sick, he used to be one of those dreamers who aren't corrected by failures in life experience. His faith in the best, in the winning truth, that used to achieve a fanatic dedication, was exceptionally sincere and possessed some touch of poetry. Mayor's sincere faith in just the truth that law could only exist for exerted influence not only on his students. Dmitry was convinced that theory should always go in line with practice. And very often he used to speak in the court. Once he happened to participate in a trial regarding one merchant from Kazan. One should give a tribute to the merchant, who was quite inventive and speculative. Each time his trading house business went downhill, he claimed to be a broke. Consequently, his creditors were forced to be limited by just as little as 5-10 copies per ruble, initially paid to the businessman. And as a merchant, he obviously decided to spin over such an affair. Dmitry Mayer decided to interfere in the office business and got deep into paperwork, where he spent all of his spare time to find the papers. As a result, Mayer succeeded to prove the fact of deception and the merchant was put in jail, until he entirely paid all of his bills back to the creditors. And here begins the most curious part. Right on being released from the prison, the merchant headed directly to his persistent auditor, where they had quite an interesting talk. I do respect you, the merchant said to Mayer. Now I understand what means conducting a fair business. I've always acted as it was accustomed, but you opened my eyes. After that talk, the merchant asked Mayer to consult him regarding each aspect of his business, since now and down he would believe him and him alone. But Mayer was a too gifted and bright character to be able to accept all of the love people offered. Kazan citizens preferred his speeches on the court to jazzy theatric benefices. However, the colleagues weren't the same anonymous. One of the students claimed Mayer not to be appreciated by his science mates. He posed himself as a bitter reproach to them, being the example of how much could have been done for the youth. But that definition hardly matched the explanation. The university tutors demonstrated their attitude to Mayer by electing a 34-year-old tutor to be the dean of the legal faculty. The elections took place on the 18th of February 1953. The new dean himself was loudly complaining for his rather willing to deal with science than household problems. Under no circumstances, he wrote, my dinnery is to neither suppress my previous plans or intentions, nor it's going to command me any addiction to Kazan where I still remain a stranger so far, despite my ten years of staying here. But it was exactly Mayer's stay in Kazan that mostly predefined one of his students' destiny and eventually the destiny of literature and philosophy thought in Russia. The student, though, seemed to be rather careless. Today I've been jealous about him, as Mayer wrote, and I took a notice he was not eager to study at all. It's a pity, he remarked. He's got such expressive facial features and such clever eyes. With a good will and self-dependence, he might have made a wonderful gentleman. Nevertheless, the student with a count courtesy title finally appreciated his tutor's care. He quitted philosophy, which wasn't too successful, and oriental languages too, and transferred to the legal faculty in 1846. As a legal creative work, Mayer offered the young count to compare two legislative documents, Ekaterina II's decree and the legal spirit by Charles Louis de Montesquieu. The work captured the young student, and in order to concentrate on the research, he left for his country estate. However, new horizons opened ahead of him. Montesquieu was followed by Rousseau and others, and so on and so forth. The student abandoned his classes and had to leave the university. That student with clever eyes was never called to the bar. He stated at his county manor, titled Jasna Polana goes for Claire Glade. Eventually, in four years, his story titled Childhood was released in the popular almanac of Sarimeni, goes for contemporary. Soon the Russian literature celebrated Leo Tolstoy. Years passed. Mayer had spent more than 10 years in Kazan, but he was still dreaming of coming back to St. Petersburg University. In 1855, after long ineffective attempts, one more chance appeared ahead. 
That was a vacancy at the chair of civil law. Besides, after the Crimea War and Nicholas I passing away, the situation in the society seemed to have changed. So mayor's free thinking didn't make the same difference to Petersburg administration anymore. But in order to enable mayor occupy that position, a massive social campaign was needed. The modest professor of jurisprudence was written about in the magazine of Sarimennik, goes for the contemporary. The author of the article was Nikolai Chernyshevsky. The article was presented as a review on Mayer's brochure on significance of practice in the system of contemporary legal education. In the article, Chernyshevsky called Mayer one of our best professors of legal science and gave a description of his attorney's clinics in detail. It used to happen like this. Professor would invite a client, tired of running through legal institutions for solving his issue, and fixed his problem, his students standing by in the study. He investigated the problem in detail, offering extended consulting on the case. His friend's concern helped. In December 1855, Dmitry Ivanovich moves back to St. Petersburg and starts teaching civil law at the legal faculty of the university. But the fatal destiny measured too little time for him. By then, Mayer had come to the final stage of consumption. Till the end of his days, he worked hard, neither letting himself nor others even for a second think of the disease that treated him. One of his trusty friends from student years was defending his doctorate degree at that time. Mayor promised to come and support him. On seeing how bad Mayor's consumption was, his friend started to talk him into staying at home. Today I still have power to help you, yet tomorrow they may be not enough. Mayor answered. He died two days later, after the hearing, his hands grabbing the sheets of sketches for another lecture. Mayor was buried at a local Lutheran cemetery. His stump got lost among others. The same bad fortune was anticipating Mayer's works. He had no system of compositions. The fact his works were assembled by students, his followers, it speaks for itself. It indicates that his works were estimated, and then they were republished many times ever after. His unique lectures he used to read without using any records. His students did the unique work by assembling the lectures by their favorite tutor into one system. The collection published in 1856 by Alexander Ritsin was entitled The Russian Civil Law. Between the lines of that publication, there's a great amount of work done by hundreds of people who managed to restore all the discoveries and ideas of their outstanding teacher. And still, 150 years after Mayer's death, no dissertation on civil law can be written on passing his works by. Later, one of his students, Alexander Witsen, headed the arbitrage court in Russia. Then legal reforms followed, and since then a new era began in the court. So Mayer's school that had started long before began to live in accordance with a bit different rules. We are completing our brief story about Dmitry Mayer, yet we don't say goodbye to himself. Each branch of jurisprudence in the same area of civilistics contains the whole areas of scientific heritage. Scientific heritage of Russian civilistics enumerates dozens of volumes. The first one of them opens with works by Dmitry Mayer.